everybody, Kaya Ward Cheers here, welcoming you to this special edition, this special program happening tonight called You Are Not Alone. And of course, this is in remembrance of Pregnancy and Infant Loss Remembrance Day, which is today, October 15th. The month as a whole is a day to remember. However, today is the day in which we recognize those who have lost um, their babies in pregnancy and certainly who have lost infants. And as we know, research shows that Black women lose their pregnancies as well as infants at a much higher rate than our counterparts of different races. And so with that in mind, we simply wanted to have this conversation. And tonight I am joined by three incredible women who are brave enough, courageous enough um, to really share their stories on this topic. It's so important because in the Black community, I've found that a lot of people are suffering silently. There are a lot of women who, when it comes to pregnancy loss and um, the loss of an infant, are not really sharing their story. They're sharing it perhaps with their one person. They don't really know how to move forward. They don't know how to grieve. And of course, at KWS Ministries, we believe strongly that in sharing our stories of grief, we give other people permission to grieve. So it's my prayer and it is my hope tonight that if you are tuning in, if you are watching this um, episode, that you are able to connect with the stories of one of these three ladies. That through this conversation, there might be laughs, there might be tears, something might be said or done that takes you a step forward on your journey of grief, okay? All right, so as we move forward, I'm joined again by three wonderful people. The first is Tronda Ma. She's my sister, not just, not like, oh, my bestie sister, but like legit same mom and dad <laughs> sister. So um, it's Tronda. Um, she's going to share her story. She uh, experienced a miscarriage. We also have Delisha Stafford. Um, we are Spartans, whoop, whoop, UNCG. And so one of my college besties. And so again, she also experienced a miscarriage. And then we have Sequoia. And Sequoia is, has a really special and unique story um, where she really bridges that line between miscarriage and infant loss. And so she'll be sharing her story. And so before we jump into questions, ladies, I want to give each one of you about, if you just take a second, just to kind of give us, just share your story with us. So Tronda, if you'll kick it off for us. All right. Um, well, I was... Um, a young whippersnapper. Uh, wait, um, I was 30, mm, 31 um, when I found out I was um, pregnant again. Um, and um, I was actually uh, almost around, almost three months um, pregnant at the time. Um, and we were always the type of um, family that when, as soon as we found out we were pregnant, we'd share like we shared with the kids, we shared with the family, our friends, you know, we just shared. Um, and so I had done, we had done all of that. Um, and one night, um, uh, it was a Wednesday night, um, we had Bible study, my husband's a pastor of a church. And so we um, were there and I remember going to the bathroom. I wasn't feeling my best, but I went to the bathroom and I just, just felt kind of icky. Um, and there was also some discoloration. And so I was like, oh, you know, let me just, you know, let me call the doctor and let me just go home. So I ended up um, going home. And by the time I got home, I needed to use the bathroom again. And so when I did, there was just it was bright red. And so I was like, oh my goodness, is this really happening? Because I think it, like no one can prepare for that. Um, and so I, you know, tried to call my husband, but he was actively teaching. And so I was calling, I ended up calling another member and I was like, hey, you know, could you tell him, <laughs> you know, to, you know, come to the hospital. Um, and so I drove myself to the hospital, got in there. Um, and I think one of the things that I don't think people tell you, um, and I don't think it's necessarily because they're trying to keep it, but they just, you don't hear about it, is literally how much blood loss you go through. And so I had on my clothes, I had on, you know, protection and everything. And I literally was standing and leaking um, to the point where, like, when I went in and checked in, they told me, you know, to go, like, to go sit down. And I was like, well, I need to go to the bathroom again. I go to the bathroom and I'm literally there wiping up blood off the floor. That's how much was coming from me. I literally couldn't contain it. Um, and you know, in my mind, I'm like, oh my goodness, why was I wiping it up off the floor of the hospital, you know? But again, I'm not thinking straight at that time. Um, and so they finally got me back. Um, and it seemed to take forever for them to, you know, check me and um, to do, you know, a, another ultrasound or sonogram. And um, I mean, just forever. And then finally, finally, what seemed to be hours after, like, somebody comes in and it's like, uh, yes, we don't see, uh, or we don't hear a heartbeat. Um, you can go home. 
and follow it with your doctor tomorrow. Wow. That was, was, that was it. Like literally that was it. And I was like, I mean, like, how do you process that? How do you, how does, you know, cause literally it's like one moment you are and one moment you're not like, and, and like this, the compassion, the sympathy, empathy, like all of that. It was like, hold on, where do you realize what you just said? You know? Okay. Um, so I ended up, uh, my husband met me there and then um, one of the other church members too. And anyway, we ended up, we ended up going home and um, I called my doctor the next day and my doctor said, um, so, and she was so sweet and kind. Anyway, um, she said, there are one of two things you can do. One, you can have a DNC, I think is what it's called. And so you could literally have the surgery um, to have it removed, have the um, you know, fetus removed, the baby removed, um, or you can let things happen naturally. This is the thing. Technically, she didn't say baby and she didn't say fetus. What she said was, you know, any you know, tissue can be removed. And then she said, or oh, you can let that tissue um, you know, come out naturally. Wow. And so me, in my mind, I wasn't thinking a baby. I don't know why I wasn't thinking that. And I think a lot of it was just, again, I'm sitting there in shock, right. you know, that this is even happening. But so, so, so I literally reiterated, okay, so tissues coming out. So, um, you know, and I'm thinking maybe the lining of my, right. Right. I mean, like, that's where my head is. Yeah. It's literally yeah. not a baby. And so um, I was like, well, you know, if the, if, if the tissue was going to come out anyway in a couple of days, why would I go in and have a surgery? Right. That could, you know, and so I was like, okay, you know, I'll just, I'll, I'll, you know, just wait for things to happen naturally. Mm -hmm. Again, thinking tissue. So, um, so the, uh, so the doctor gives me, you know, medications and things like that. And so one morning I literally woke up and I was like, oh my goodness, what is wrong? Like I felt horrible, but the only thing I could compare it to was labor that I had with my first son. And so I was like, and I literally got up and I was like, Brian, I feel like I'm having contractions. Like, and the only thing he said was, well, remember that medicine that the doctor said he would, she would give you? And I was like, oh yeah. Duh. So I went and took the medicine and literally fell right back asleep. Then I ended up waking up a little bit later and had to use the bathroom, but I had a very strong urge to use the bathroom. Mm -hmm. I used the bathroom and out comes my baby in the toilet. And I was so terrified because I wasn't thinking this baby was coming out. I was thinking tissue, like maybe clotting with the period. I'm like, that's what I was thinking. And so it comes out in the toilet. And like, I literally glance and like turn away and flush because I'm like, oh my God. And so not only did I suffer the miscarriage, but I literally had to go through that process of, did I just, what right. did I just do? Right. And so... I, that, like, I can't even explain right. how I, I dealt with that other than I know it was nothing right. to God to get me right. that. Um, because I not only felt like I was not only in shock, but I also felt embarrassed. I also felt like, hold on, why didn't she say baby? Right. You know, I, there were so many, so many thoughts that went through my, through my mind at that time, but literally that was, um, that, that was my miscarriage experience. Um, my miscarriage ended up happening because I also had a fibroid and the fibroid ended up um, pulling the blood from the baby. Um, and so I did later on have to have surgery to have that fibroid removed, but that is my story. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing, Tronda. And actually it's crazy because that was my first time hearing the whole story itself. So that is, wow, that is powerful. Um, D. Do you mind sharing your story? Sure. Um, so my story is August 30th, 2015. And the reason why we know that, the reason why I know that date is kind of seared in my mind was because we were in South Carolina for the um, HBCU Battle of the Bands. And um, we had had a great time. We um, hadn't told anybody, but by our estimate, 
we were about 10 or 11 weeks and we actually had a doctor's appointment scheduled that following Friday to go get confirmed. But I had taken like three pregnancy tests. So I knew, Oh, we're, we're having a baby. Oh my gosh. So we went down and the day before, um, I think it was a Saturday, the day before I wasn't really feeling good. Um, like you were saying, Tondra, I was having to go to the bathroom a lot and I was noticing a lot of spotting, but they say, you know, um, Oh, don't be too concerned. It may just, you know, it might, it might not be anything. And so um, to preface all of this, I also suffer from massive fibroids and I also have endometriosis, which basically means that tissue grows in places that it's not supposed to, which is also something that's not commonly talked about. All of that will come into uh, play later on. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we drove down to South Carolina, we were having a really good time. Um, and I just kept noticing that I needed to drink a lot more water. I had to use the bathroom a lot more, like more than my normal um, having to go. And then midway through, um, I can't remember who was on the field. I leaned over to my husband and said, we got to go. Like, I just, I don't, I feel off. Something's not right. Um, I'm cramping a lot. Like I'm about to be on my cycle and I have horrible cramps. Like to the point I have to get prescription strength ibuprofen. Like it's bad. The first, my first two days we were down for the count. Um, and so he was like, do you think you can tough it through? Like they're almost finished. And I was like, yeah, you know, I'll, I can tough it through. It's fine. It's fine. I'll just do, if you notice me breathing really hard, it's just because I'm, you know, I'm experiencing a really bad cramp, but I'm having a good time and I don't want to leave just yet. Right. So um, the band's finished. It was wrapping up. They were handing out the awards or whatnot. And so he was like, all right, well, let's go ahead and go and get you to the car. And as I was standing up, I just felt something just drop down. And I was like, we have to go somewhere now. So we ended up at the, um, we ended up at the emergency room in South Carolina. And the first question they asked me was, what religion are you? Not, how are you feeling? Not, you know, your heart or anything like that. They didn't run any tests. They were like, what religion are you? So we know what room to put you in. I was offended by that. I'm, I'm having a moment, wow. you know, I'm having a mini health crisis and you're worried more about what my religion is like that. that take care of me. Yeah. And so they got, they ushered me in um, and they said that my, um, all of my um, signs were reading normal and that my cervix hadn't opened up enough. So they couldn't tell me if I was having a miscarriage or not. Essentially, we went there and they, they didn't do anything for me. Meanwhile, I am actively now sweating. I'm still cramping. I'm very uncomfortable. And they just turned us away. So, um, we were like, okay, well, let's just cross state borders and we'll try again in North Carolina. And as we were riding into um, North Carolina, it just, the cramping just got worse. It just, I was just, I, at that point, I was having such intense cramps. I think I almost broke Joseph's hand because I was just clinging on for dear life because I was in such pain. Mm -hmm. So we get to an emergency room in, in North Carolina and it's all I can do to focus, to stand at the waiting desk. Um, to get checked in and the lady asked ask me do I want a wheelchair as I'm about to fall out so they get me into a wheelchair they um, hustle me into a room and the ER lady immediately starts asking me all of these really rude questions like in retrospect I understand that she was trying to get to the point but because we hadn't said anything about our pregnancy we didn't we didn't tell them uh, what was going on they were like oh well you're just making it up. You're, you're a black woman. You, you you have a higher pain tolerance. You're just making this up. And so, um, they were like, we'll just get down to figure out why you're still bleeding. Cause at this point I'm still actively bleeding. And so, um, they run to go get the test ready or whatnot. And I told Joseph, I was like, I have to go to the bathroom. He was like, do you want help? And I told him, no, you know, I want to be able to like walk on my own, maybe pushing through would be my thing. And so I remember getting into the bathroom and I was also bleeding all over everywhere. There was blood following me down the hallway, getting to the bathroom and cause they wanted a, they needed a sample. They needed a urine sample. And so I, I breathe and I feel something slip out of me. And so in my urine sample, I've caught my baby and I have to bring that back to them. Wow. And like, literally they were like, no one believed that I had had the miscarriage until they actually saw it in the sample. And then all of a sudden, 
everything moved to sympathy or they were like, oh, we're so sorry, you know. And at that point, I was numb inside because, you know, you didn't, you didn't care. Or you didn't have any sympathy at all when I'm describing to you what my symptoms are, what I think that I'm going through until you actually see it with your own eyes. Um, and so we finally got checked out of the, um, the hospital because I didn't want to stay overnight. Um, I wanted to be surrounded by my own things and be comfortable in my own place. Mm -hmm. And so this was two, three in the morning. We drove until so Joseph couldn't drive anymore. He was about, he was falling asleep at the wheel. He was like, I'm so sorry. You know, I, I can't stay awake. Um, do you want to check into a hotel? And I said, no, I'll drive home. I, I, I can't explain it to you, but I need to be home. And so in the midst of my pain, like we drove those last couple of hours, we got back um, into, we were living in Charlotte at the time. We got back in about 5 a.m. And then I laid in the bed and I didn't move for about 72 hours. And so I'll, I'll pause my story right there so that others can share. Wow. Thank you, Dee. Um, Sequoia, will you share your story, please? Yes. Um, I found out I was pregnant the end of September 2019 um, planned. We were hoping that this was going to happen for us, and it did. Um, we found out in December that it was a, another boy. We were very excited. Um, the pregnancy had been perfect, no issues. Um, I mean, everything was just perfect until it wasn't. I went in on May 15th, um, 37 weeks pregnant for my another weekly ultrasound so at this point um that morning i woke up early because i knew i had the appointment but also i felt very off and i couldn't explain why i felt off i just felt honestly i thought i was like i'm gonna go in they're gonna tell me we're gonna have a baby today because i just didn't feel right and so i got there to my appointment she asked me how i was feeling i was like yeah, i'm okay we go back to do the ultrasound and um it's the lady who the sonographer is also the lady who was my son, my first son sonographer. So she's known me for years. Mm -hmm. And um, she puts the ultrasound machine on. And I know the way she operates. And she was just very different that day. She, you know, said, we're going to look at the baby. She put the ultrasound machine on and took it off really quick and said, Dr. Patel's going to want to see you before you leave. And so I'm like, in my head, I knew that wasn't, I was like, well, that's kind of weird. But again, I'm thinking, we're going to have a baby today. You know, like I know that the, I know I'm having a baby today. I just, I feel off. I feel like we're ready. Well, the doctor comes in and she looks at me and I'm laying back with my big old belly out. And she's like, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm 30, 37 weeks pregnant, I guess as, a, as okay as I can be. Yeah. And um, she goes, when's the last time you felt the baby move? And my heart sunk because I, that morning at 2 a.m. I had woken up and I couldn't remember the last time that I felt a really big move from him. Mm -hmm. um, and so I kind of had like a check in my spirit. I kind of like was like, mm, I know I have an appointment at eight o'clock that morning. It's going to be okay. So this is at two that morning. Going for my appointment at eight, doctor comes in and says everything that she says. And she goes, Sequoia, there's not a heartbeat. And everything just sort of stopped. Everything stopped. Um, still kind of stop still now and so um all they could see at that point was that that there was um a, a clot in his heart um through the sonogram they could they didn't know why and so she told me that um i'm sorry y'all no apology needed um, no apology she told me she put me in a room the doctor did and she um, said that you know we're gonna have to deliver obviously because I'm 37 weeks pregnant um going to deliver she said I could go that day to go deliver um or I could wait for her the next day and since I had known her um I made the choice to wait till the next day mm -hmm. so that I could be with my doctor um and so that um, I had to go home I had I have kids here at home with me so I had to come home and prepared them to go somewhere um, with someone because I knew I was going to be admitted the next morning. I got them ready. They went um, to family. The next morning we went in and it all just feels like you just can't believe it's, it's happening because like right now I'm sitting in his room. You have everything ready and prepared. You have, you know, you're expecting to have a baby, to have your child. And um, 
you know, like I said, I always say everything was fine until it wasn't. So I went, I go in to deliver the, um, the nurses try the, their best to try to be as sensitive as, you know, they, they can. Um, they tell you, we know the baby's no longer alive, but we need to check. Do we just need to, we need to check again. So that's a dagger every time someone's coming in and checking over and over and over again. And so I'm in labor for about 19 hours. I go in that Saturday morning. I'm in labor for about 19 hours. During the labor, um, I get really sick and my blood pressure goes through the roof. So I'm not doing well. Um, so they had to put me on magnesium as I'm trying to deliver, um, a baby that I know is going to come out and not going to cry. And so that's kind of what we attributed a lot of that. A lot of my sickness was just like the overwhelming grief that I was in um, and going through. We didn't, at that point, we still didn't know what happened to Levi, which that's his name. His name's Levi J. Layton. Um, We didn't know what happened to him. So like I said, 19 hours of labor, he comes, you know, he's beautiful. He's perfect. Uh, Everything that you would think a baby would be. And then that's when we saw what happened. Um, the cord was wrapped twice around his neck. Um, so that's what took his life. And so, um, you know, I, I'm left here having to deal with, you know, not only was I, you know, not able to, I'm his mom, I should have known what was going on and I didn't. And the thing that's supposed to give you life took his life. And so, um, I'm here. And May 17th is when he was born. He was five pounds, 19 inches. Um, perfect, whole, complete, just not alive. So. And Sequoia, your story, that happened this year, right? Yes. So in the middle have, of this is minute. This is about to be five months. Wow. So, so it's super raw and super new and right. still right. scary and shaky and the when I talk about it, the emotions still come right back as if it was the day that I heard that there was not a heartbeat. So yeah. Yeah. It's and a, a question I have for you, Sequoia, mm-hmm. and um same for you, uh Trina and D, and that is so Sequoia, because we're in the middle of a pandemic. So I assume, is it safe to assume when you found the news, was your spouse allowed to be in the room with you? Right. So were to deliver, like, yes, but the news, I was alone. Right. So that, so my question then for all of you is, how did you share it with your spouses? Like, how did you, how did you share with the news? Like, D, I know that Joseph was right in there with you trying to, I know Brian was teaching. Like, how did you all share the news? And not only with your spouses, but it can be just a, that's a much larger question. How did you share it with people? Like, and how did you, how did you share it? So for me, um, so for me, um, I was at the um, hospital uh, when my husband got word that I was there and that I was bleeding. Um, and so once he got there, um, I mean, literally, I'm, I'm bleeding, like, profuse, profusely. Um, and so I didn't really have to say much, you know, because, you know, um, I, you know, it, it happened and, and, you know, he, you could see that it was happening. Um, and he was um, actually also in there um, in the room when they came in and officially said that there was no heartbeat to. Um, and, um, and it's so interesting. I've heard, uh, and I'll continue on, but it's so interesting. I've heard Sequoia and Dee talk about their dates. And I think that's something that you never forget. Mine's March 21st, 2012, like never forget. It's like, etched in uh, my brain when it comes to telling other people um that it because especially at that time um it's such a personal thing um and one that i feel like if you haven't gone through before like you don't you you can't prepare for that and honestly i don't think you'd be able to prepare for it even if it happened again you know what I mean but so for me to say something to you know other people like I I don't know that I knew what to say Mm -hmm. um I did have some um really really close friends that I did um share it with and um but even with that I think there were parts that like I just I really hadn't fully processed it was like oh my goodness you Mm -hmm. know what I mean like um 
so with Brian, like I said, he was there present, um, you know, in the hospital room. So that's how he found out. And then when it came to sharing with other people, people knew I was pregnant. Yeah. You know, and so those that were closest to me, um, you know, I shared a little bit more. Okay. Dear Sequoia, would either one of you like to tap into that? How you shared it? I'll, um, I'll tap in. Um, Joseph was there with me, but I was alone when I had the miscarriage. And then I hid the sample from him so he didn't see me. Mm-hmm. So he didn't know that I had suffered it until the nurses confirmed it. Um, we, because we were waiting to go to the doctors to make this grandiose announcement, um, no one really knew. Um, I think we only told my in-laws, my mother, um, and the uh, pastors at the church that we were going to, we kept it really close knit because we didn't want anyone to know. Mm-hmm. And in retrospect, it was because I felt a lot of shame and not being able to carry. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we didn't tell, or we didn't make a social media post about it until um, a, a year later. And it was because we were getting asked, um, oh, you know, y'all have been married a few years now. When are you guys going to think about having kids? And it's one thing to be asked that question before a miscarriage. But when you're asked that and you have suffered loss, you are ready to fight everybody. I'm not a violent person, but everyone who asked me that, I wanted to deck them. (laughs) Because it's so emotional and it tears up. And so I use that. I, I use the social media post to not only say, hey, this is a this is a loss that we've suffered. Please stop asking when we're going to have kids. But I used it as a, a chance to allow people to a rethink what they ask people around the holiday season because it mm-hmm. always seemed like right around the holidays it was, was when we were getting asked that question. Right. And two, be more sensitive to people because you don't know what they're going through, right? Mm-hmm. They don't they're not obligated to share anything with you. Mm-hmm. So just being more mindful of the questions that you're asking of of, of people around you. And so every year now we, I repost that post to say, Hey, holidays are coming up. I know you're thinking about shopping and eating and all that, but also remember, don't ask this question to people around you because you don't know what they're going through. And so now we don't get asked that question anymore because we've also kind of built a buffer to ourselves um, asking this question. So when we get asked, Oh, when are you guys gonna have when are you guys gonna have kids? Thank you so much for your fifty thousand dollar check. When can I expect it in the mail? <laughs> and every single time that I've I've given that answer, I've gotten a flush because you're not asking me when we're having kids. You're asking me about the state of my uterus. Is really what that question boils down to, and it's rude. So all that to say, don't ask people when they're when they're having kids because you don't know when, what they've gone through. Right. Right. First was um, my husband. He um, he was not at the appointment when I found out that there wasn't a heartbeat. So the doctor actually called him as I'm well and in the background. And so right. that's how he found out with the doctor calling me. Right. So right. That wow. Was kind of not there's no good way to give that news, but yeah, especially you know not a good way to give it when you hear your wife crying in the background and the doctor mm. personally calling you, which never happens. So. Right. Right. So something that's interesting, and I got some messages about this as well for people asking you all to hit on it. And that is, and as I ask the, as the questions come out, feel free if all of you address it or if one or two, you know, either way, but either way, it was asked a question of um, how to deal with the loneliness. Um, some women who are going through miscarriage or infant loss speak of a loneliness, despite having a spouse, despite having a great network, they speak of having this um, sense of loneliness. What might you say to them or how do, how do, how are you all now? navigating through that loneliness that comes with some women who experiences? I think it's God. I mean, honestly, there's, there are days, most days where I do still have my bits of loneliness that I struggle with because I mean, when you lose a baby, like that's like a part of your heart that's not with you anymore. So I don't think that there, you know, I wish I could say that there's some, you know, some soothing or that it heals. I don't think that's something that ever really is going to go away. Mm -hmm. I'm not anticipating that for my own loss. Um, But I think God gives you the peace to be able to cope with it and um, to walk it, walk through it, you know, like not, but doesn't necessarily take it away. And part of me, as crazy as it sounds like, that's all I have left of my baby. And so I don't really want that dull ache that I have to 
really go away because that's my only connection to him is the you know memories and just remembering him so that's my take on it I appreciate it do you're trying to anything to add to that um for someone who might be experiencing loneliness in this season and if not that's fine I don't have anything to add okay um as a Christian so um all three of you are Christian, women of faith. How did you, or how, when I say did, I'm saying did and do understanding that grief doesn't necessarily end the day after, right? It's, it's active even years, years, days, months later. So a question is, as a Christian, like how in the world do you reconcile? How do you make sense of this God who's good enough to give, to give you, to, to allow you to get pregnant? And both Trina and Sequoia, both of you already had a kid before right? It's like, God, you allowed this to happen once. And then D, it's like this notion of, God, you know this desire in my heart too. So like, as women of faith, right? Just a really candid moment. Like as women of faith, how do you reconcile? How do you make sense of this God who, who can take away like that? Who, who took from you? Like it's a personal situation. Like how do you make sense of that? Um, for me in multiple ways. So one, um, I know um, that God's ways are not mine. Mm -hmm. And honestly, it's hard to say anything other than that. You know, um, his ways aren't mine. Um, and um, so that, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is somebody ended up sharing with me, um, I believe it was, I can't remember who, um, but um, because I had a child who was um, three years old at the time, um, and he knew, you know, he was having a baby, you know, a baby sibling. And, and um, we had to then tell him, you know, that, you know, the baby had, um, had died. And so somebody ended up telling me, you know, um, uh, he, like in this situation, and this is how I ended up explaining it to Matt you know, for his, you know, little mind too, but it, it, I just found comfort in it. Mm -hmm. And that was that God wanted so badly for the first face for my baby to see, to be his. Wow. And so, I mean, even to this day, like it gives me chill, like goosebumps, goose mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know what, if that's what comforted my baby and me, <laughs> and, I'm, Yay. Um, and, you know, the last thing is um, God blessed me with the story of Hannah. Um, and, you know, Hannah wanted so badly to yeah. have, um, to have children and, um, you know, the other wife, Penina, you know, was having, you know, kids, but also taunting her. And so she was, you know, she, she, you know, just felt so bad because this was something that she wanted and she knew God knew she wanted this. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, you know, so, you know, the family was going up to pray and, you know, or, um, the husband and, you know, everything. And so anyway, one day, um, she decided to go to the temple to pray mm -hmm. and, and because this and you know and you know the history with yeah. her you know, stopping she stopped eating and you know her husband's like you know aren't I better to you than yeah. you know 10 yeah. you know and anyway so she ends up going you know up to the temple to pray and she prays in such a way that the priest thought she was drunk yeah you know I mean like literally to me that is just fully releasing everything every cry every you know angry thought every like yes. everything to god and then it literally says um in one of the translations that when um you know when she was done she walked out and her face was no longer cast down mm -hmm. and that's not to mean that the hurt wasn't still there the right. pain wasn't still there but she had given it to god and god was allowing her to move forward right. and you know in the future god blessed her with a child but even if that hadn't have happened mm -hmm. literally god blessed her to move forward and like i took that story and just hung closely to it. And honestly, to this day, I mean, granted, I don't know and may never know, but I really feel like that second child of mine was going to be a girl and her name is, was going to be Hannah. And so right. literally, that's in my mind, when I think of, you know, my second child, I think of Hannah. Right. Like literally her name was going to be Hannah Lee Moss. <laughs> but um, that's how um, I've been able to deal with it. And, and just when I've spoken, you know, um, to different groups or whatever, like literally the story of Hannah just holds a very special place in my heart, specifically because of how God blessed me through that. Right. Literally. Right. 
Sequoia and D, anything to add to the way that as women of faith, you've reconciled the loss? I think um, I'm still. Oh, go ahead, Sequoia. Go I'm ahead. Sorry. I think I'm still working on that. There are days that I get up and I am still very angry. Yeah. You know, like I'm hurt and I'm angry. And um, why me? You know, like we have, why me? Why yeah. my baby? Why do I get, you know, why do I see all these people who can be really like terrible people and they get to right. have their babies and they got to take, they get to take their babies home. Yeah. And I had to not only, you know, like lose my baby, but I mean, went through this entire process and yeah. it's just why. But I think um, in the hospital, when I was delivering, you know, Levi, I, I was I was like, God, why? You know, give me an answer. I, I need to know why. I need to know why this is happening to me. And in that moment, I felt the Holy Spirit, you know, hold me and tell me, you know, basically like Chanda was saying, like, even if, you know, we had we had hope that Levi was going to come out and be alive, even yeah. though we knew there wasn't a heartbeat. The med, you know, doctors were telling us there wasn't a heartbeat, but we had hope that he was going to come out alive. And um, just even if not, he's still good. Yeah. yeah. Even if, even if, you know, this is the ugliest thing that could happen in my life, that God still gets the praise in that. And that's what the enemy does not want. He doesn't mm -hmm. want that. You yeah. know, he wants my husband and my, my kids to be upset and devastated and angry and yeah. to see this, you know, ugly, mean God, but God is kind and he's yeah. merciful and he, yeah. and and in, in all of this ugliness, he has still shown up and given me peace. He has planned every single intricate detail that has happened through all of this. That's right. You know, perfectly put me in the right spot, put me at the right campus so that I could have someone who was, who went through this 20 years earlier to walk wow. me through this now. Wow. You know, that that's nothing but God, you know, like that's not, that's not just a chance thing. Right. And so I just feel I'm reconciling by something positive is going to come out of this even mm -hmm. if i can't see it that's something right. beautiful is going to come out of levi's life mm -hmm. and so that's what i have to choose to believe every day i don't believe that but that's yeah. what i have to get up and make a conscious effort to believe every day mm -hmm. wow um, anything to add I, I walked away i said you knew the desire of my heart and you took it away from me so i'm done mm -hmm. i i'm done and it was a year of rediscovering what my faith looked like now that I've had this loss. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing that came to me was you are loved and you are needed by your village. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand what that was until I was asked to be a god mom. And I had been asked several times and then my niece was born and it made me realize, you know, I get, this is an opportunity for me to be a good God mommy, a good auntie, to not only give the kids culture, yeah. but introduce them to new concepts and things. And honestly, let the moms have a breather. You yeah. know, I, Auntie D can come swoop in real quick, take the kids away for a day, you know, let you have some self-care, let you have some me time. That's part of the village. And that's where I'm that, honestly, that's where I feel like where I'm at in my season right now is I'm okay with not being a parent because the village needs me. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm able to come and, and swoop, swoop up and take care of the kids. And then I can lovingly give y'all that. But <laughs> being able to have that opportunity to kind of refresh, revamp, because, you know, moms are exhausted. And that's something that's not talked about at all. And you're soldiering on, you're soldiering on, and you're at the point where you have nothing left to give, yeah. but you have to find some way. That's what the village is for, you know? Right. So I'm, I'm embracing that season. And it took me a while to realize that's where I'm at, but I'm embracing that season now. God bless you, Dee. That's awesome. Yeah, it is. Awesome. And one of the things, when you talked about what people don't talk about, I'm so intrigued by how many people really don't talk about miscarriage, <clears throat> excuse me, or infant loss. And I was so surprised, like, even when I posted the graphic for this event, right, or for this program, for this talk, for this roundtable, when I posted a graphic, my inbox literally blew up of women like, uh, Kaya, I'm so glad we're doing that. Kaya, oh my gosh, I'm so grateful. Kaya, uh, you know, uh, people who were looking like thirsting for this conversation. And it really made me realize how many people, how many women are suffering silently, right? And so just really like, why, why do we think women suffer, why do, like, in women, we can suffer silently in anything. Come on, that's a whole nother conversation. 
but specifically <laughs> when it comes to pregnancy loss, when it comes to infant loss, why do we suffer silently? And it's so interesting because I've heard so many words, like I've heard even in our conversation today, the word ashamed. I've heard the word embarrassment. I've heard these words. So like, can y'all just kind of talk a little bit more about that? Like, why is it that so many suffer silently? Because there are a lot of women who are experiencing this, whether it's because of endometriosis or did I say it right, Dee? Endometriosis. Endometriosis, thank you. Or fibroids or, you know, a, a, a array of things. You know, there are many different things. And so my question for you is why do you think that specifically, so from your Black, as a Black woman perspective, why do we suffer in silence when it comes to pregnancy loss or infant loss? I think it is a lot of it, um, like we feel ashamed mm-hmm. and embarrassed. I think, you know, carrying a baby and having children is the one thing like that society really puts on women and like yeah. if you're not able to do that and do it successfully then right. like, for some reason you're some you're, you're less of a woman if right. you mm-hmm. aren't able to do that and so um I think especially just being black women mm-hmm. as well we're trying to break a lot of generational curses that we yes. you know go through and just as as a people we don't really talk about mm-hmm. yeah. things, and especially <laughs> like we don't talk right. about you know one thing for you know in my situation my family like when it happened and I was with my grandmother so I have lots of you know older people in my family and Levi is just not something that we talk about it's just not something that you know like we just their whole mentality is you have another child you got to suck it up wow you got to you know you got to just you have to move on you have to be there for him so that's their mentality so I know that that's not a safe place that I can you know, go and yeah. talk to Levi, you know, talk about Levi with certain people. Right. And so I just think a lot of it's just going to be us really breaking those barriers and having other Black women that come out and talk about it and say their children's name and remember, you know, the babies that they've lost. Mm-hmm. Because like I said, we just, we as a people really can just kind of just stuff things down and kind of refuse to go there. Right. I think it also, and I agree, Sequoia, um, but I think, or, and I think it also, for me, um, had a lot to do with just being willing to be vulnerable, Mm -hmm. that vulnerable while going through something so personal, Mm -hmm. Um, because, I mean, whether or not you think about whether or not someone's going to judge you or not, like, you have all of these feelings and emotions inside, and you're like, oh my goodness, you know, what would they say? And that should not even begin to be the first thought on your mind, right. you know, you know, during a time like this, but just, I think that's part of my thing, like just being willing to be that vulnerable, um, to share my shame that I was feeling, whether or not it was right or wrong or not, which I know it's not, you know, but just being willing to share the shame um, or the embarrassment that I felt or, you know, the hurt or the shock, because that was the main thing, just shock, like, this, this, you know, wake up the next morning, this, 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 you know, um, but yeah, just that, that vulner- vulnerability piece. And yes, I mean, like, we came from a family where everything was hush hush, you know, kind of, so, you know, you could you literally be dying and not tell anybody. Look, so. Literally, literally, I talked about that in the series. But it's right. interesting, Tron, it's interesting because when, it's interesting when you talk about that, because it's, it's interesting for the 50th time to talk about that simply because I'm trying to get my thought together because I'm trying to think of what, what year did you, what year did, did you miss Carrie Tronda? 2012. So I'm thinking back in 2012, I'm trying to remember how old I was, but I was younger. So I'm seven. seven, oh, seven. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> Math is not her forte. No, I it's not. 31, 31 minus seven. Okay. So you can, y'all can do the math. And then, <laughs> so I'm trying to figure out, I was like, I remember mom telling me, and I remember she said, I remember her exact words were um, trying to lost the baby. And I, but it was interesting because as you all are talking and I'm getting, she said it because it was just, you know, it was in conversation, but, and that's how we talk about women, you know, who've experienced miscarriage. But I'm like, how many times are women, even just simple things we say like, oh, they lost the baby, mm-hmm. right? It's, it's kind of like not the most sensitive thing to say. And like, I don't realize right, it. Right, like, like, I, I, yeah. Y'all are yeah. talking. It's like, like, as if you did. And of course, mom didn't mean it like that. And, oh, right. and you never do. But right. my point is like, how many times do we really 
say things like those who have not experienced the loss say things like insensitively and like that's a whole nother part of the conversation because d like do you got on your ready face <laughs> okay like d already mentioned like people are like when are you gonna have a kid when are you gonna have a kid right there's that and there's so many things that we can do that's really not sensitive to it and so my question is for those who do have people in their units in their family girlfriends whatever experiencing miscarriage or infant loss what can we say? Like for those of us like, because this is an educational opportunity, what can we say? What can we do? How can we do it? Right. And I understand grief is different all the way around, but what would you tell for that woman who is looking and watching right now? Because she's like, this is happening to my friend, this happened to my cousin, my sister, my auntie. How can I be there for them? What would you all say? Like, how can we be there for our friends and our family members experiencing this? Because as you all mentioned, in the Black culture, especially those of us who have older family members, like, who gonna bring this up at the table, right? It's not something you talk about. It's something you pray about, but you don't <laughs> talk about it. So how can we, how can we support you? And any of you can answer that. Take over the um, <laughs> conversation, so... No, you're fine. Anyone can answer. I think um, one of the things that um, is very important, um, just when it comes to relationships, period, like just, I think depending on the type of relationships um, that you form and develop with, you know, um, with your circle, with your, you know, um, people who you can, uh, consider or close, like those relationships um, dictate, I feel like how comfortable you feel being fully transparent. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if there's anything that I would encourage people to do now that would help out with not just miscarriage, but also with so many other things in life. And that is, you know, truly, truly focus on what relationships should really be. Mm -hmm. should really look like um what god would have for them to be because we we were put here on earth to be together right <laughs> um but there's so many things that can you know pull you apart or there's different things that can um you know challenge your relationships and things like that and when those are challenged then you don't necessarily feel as open right. um and and willing to just share wholly right. um fully um and so yeah, like, do you, do you get kind of what I'm what I'm saying? Like, and I feel like if if that were the case, then I think people may share a bit more openly with those whom they consider, you know, close. Awesome. Dee or Sequoia? Dee, do you want to say something? You got it, Sequoia. I was just gonna say, um, <laughs> just in regards to infant loss and um, miscarriage, I just think people. I would like for people to understand that. A lot of people say, I don't have, I don't know the words. I don't have the words to say to you. And the right. thing is, like, there's nothing anyone can say to you during something like this to make you be like, oh, okay. You know, like, you're right. This is better. You know, like, there's nothing that's going to make that pain less. But right. being present and still checking in, being consistent, even if you don't know what to say and being intentional that way, right. I think that's the best way how you can help moms or just people who are grieving and you know right. period like just be there show up ask yeah. let me drop a meal off don't don't say do you want me just do it you right. know like yes. here here's a gift card to whatever you know i'm thinking of you here's a card just something to show that you're thinking of them because that's i think people think that they have to fix something to right. be there and you don't that. have to fix anything like right. just show up like trying to said we're not meant to be here by, you know, be alone. We're right. meant to, you know, gather and be there for each other. Right. And so I think that gets lost sometimes. Right. Trying to fix things. You can't fix this. Yeah. Sequoia, I love that you said that. Before I come to you, D, I love that you said that, Sequoia, when you were like, don't ask, just do it. Because, and it kind of goes back to what we were saying a little bit earlier about suffering in silence. Part of that suffering in silence and just being a Black woman, we have it together. You get what I'm saying? We have it together when we don't have it together in real life. So it's that notion, do you need, no, 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 I'm fine, thanks. Right? Like, I'm going to trauma and I feel like cooking, what? Right. And so yeah. I think that is so you bring up such a good point there, you know, of just the simple, the simple things of a Grubhub virtual gift card, something, mm -hmm. you know, yes. 
that's that's good that's that's good. even a, like i said a car just i'm thinking of you signature right. like it doesn't have to be anything really deep or yeah you know just just yeah. showing up yeah. showing up yeah d what do you have to add all of that and being consistent with it because you it's not just something that happens and then it ends yeah and it's not something that you know it happens and then you know a, a couple of months go by oh you should be okay by now right that's not the case at all grief does whatever it wants to it'll show up anytime that it wants to Come on. and so one of the things that i appreciated for my village that they showed up they didn't just make sure that i was okay they checked on joseph and made sure that he was okay too so yeah. you know if you're going to show up yeah. commit to showing up consistently and yeah there might be some pushback be like you know i got it i'm good no show up anyway because again going back to something that i said earlier you know you don't know what people are struggling with so they may be in a depressive cycle they may be having an anxious moment you just being there and like you were saying sequoia being fully present is enough yeah you don't have to figure it out just be there yeah yeah now and sometimes we, that looks like just sitting <laughs> sitting in silence not saying anything just i'm here yep. yeah you want to talk i'm right here let me know wow so sometimes it's even the small gestures mm -hmm. now one and, thing, and i think that's that that actually can be relative like what may seem so small exactly yeah you know for you to do right. is huge <laughs> <laughs> Right. Huge. Um, like, for instance, there's somebody um, like when I was going through, you know, uh, or when I was actually at the hospital, literally. And to this day, I'm like, oh, my goodness, you know, um, uh, and I'm, I'm, I was so appreciative. But literally, she brought me underwear. <laughs> wow. You know, like, literally. And I know that's like, really? But like, it was a blessing. <laughs> I mean, it was a blessing. But and something so super and sweet. Something, wow. Something that, that simple. Okay. So my question, another question that really comes to mind here then is this, um, what would you all say to that person experiencing, experiencing miscarriage, experiencing infant loss? Like in this season, what might y'all say to encourage them? You all have, have gone through it, are going through it for that person to whom this is fresh. What might you say? You are not alone. Mm -hmm. You, you are not alone mm -hmm. and i know that it's such a cliche statement but hearing that in the moment for me would have helped because i felt i felt like i was the only one that was suffering from it like this was the only wow. millions of people on the world but i'm the only one that's going through this you are not alone and that this is not your fault wow mm -hmm. wow i would say probably two things okay i would say um this is mom brain because it just like I saw it fly away as I'm. No, no, no. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Don't leave. <laughs> so, Tronda, do you have anything to add? <laughs> um. Oh my goodness, I had something too. Oh, oh my gosh. gosh. So pregnancy right. brain is just going around this thing. Right. It's just going around this. Um. It's okay. I can, there, there were other questions that have come in. So how about I go to some other areas of the question when it pops back up. <laughs> You come on in. Yeah, go ahead, Tronda. Oh, goodness. Hold on. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. No, well, no, what I was going to say is, um, and it was, I think it may have been touched on before too. Um, I was somebody that was actively going through it. I know we've talked about the different comments and things like that that people, you know, may say, but I think it is very important to also realize that many times, I think most of the time, even people are saying what they're saying out of love, yeah. but in a way that they have don't necessarily have experience with the situation you yeah. know what i mean yeah so you know yes i think there are definitely some people out there that you know really may be rude just to be rude because unfortunately we experience that as well yeah. um however i feel like the majority of the people you know with the you know how are you doing well <laughs> you yeah. know yeah. you know but at the same time you know i know that was their way of attempting to connect you know what I mean? That their uh, their attempt to, but um, but yeah, just just kind of keeping that in mind that you know when people say different things, you know, most of them I feel like are coming out of a place of true care and concern. Right. 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 I would say I remember some of it. Okay, <laughs> bring that what you remember. 
Yes, I would say um, that you, it's okay to feel however you feel yes. about, you know, your yes. miscarriage or your the infant loss. It's okay to feel however you want to feel. Each day can be different yeah. on how you feel. You don't have to, um, I remember the first time like that I kind of like laughed and like kind of meant my laugh. Um, I almost like was like, you know, like, what am I doing? I felt like my life is just supposed to be grief. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, um, it's okay to feel those feelings. Grief is, a, it's irrational and yeah. it's fleeting and it, it comes in and it comes out. Something can knock you off your feet, you know, five months later, like me, or, you know, some days are just okay. And it's okay to feel those feelings. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Don't be ashamed of that. You don't have to feel guilty because you might smile and have some, you know, a sense of joy some days. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So those are the, that's the big thing that I want. Cause I feel like no one told me that. And I kind of sat with that by myself, you know, kind of <laughs> just, I shouldn't be smiling or I shouldn't be happy because mm-hmm. I don't have my baby, you know, like my baby's not here. What am I happy about? Right. But I feel like it's important. But that, that's God, you know, to still be able to have a sense of it's going to be okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Grief definitely looks different for yes. everybody and that is okay. Mm-hmm. So like, I, I'm so in agreement with you, Sequoia. I mean, like just because you look at, even when you know somebody that has been through it and you look at them still, the way in which you grieve is not necessarily going to be the exactly. way in which that person exactly. grieves. And, just and because, that is. And just because someone might look like, I think there are people who look at me and they're like, oh, she's functioning. She's getting through her day. Right. That doesn't mean that I'm not hurting. That doesn't mean that today is not one of the worst days that I've had in a really long time. It's just no, it just means God is helping me cope through yeah, there my go. loss. You know, mm-hmm. like it's a God thing. It's not a me thing. I'm not just okay. Right. You know, so I think that's important for women to know. I appreciate that so much. And I can't think of a better way to wrap up this round table. And I'll say wrap up, not end, because as there are other questions and such coming in, we might have to come back to the round table, ladies. Um, but I appreciate not only your vulnerability, I appreciate your sharing. I appreciate it. And I myself am confident that in your stories, people tonight who are tuning in and who watch it over the next couple of days are going to tune in and see themselves through your story. And I'm very confident that through your stories tonight, you all have given people um, permission to grieve. Amen. So I thank God for each and every one of you. And for those of you who are watching, be sure, send this link to a friend, okay? Show a friend who you're like, look, I've been trying to figure out what to say, trying to figure out how to relate, but it's not my story. Go ahead. That's exactly it. Because for example, um, pregnancy and infant loss isn't my story. So I brought the experts to the table, okay? I brought the women to the table to whom this is their story. And so keeping that in mind, let's share the story. Let's bring it into conversation so that our fellow sisters do not have to suffer alone. And so that the spouse houses of those experiencing this loss are not suffering alone, but so that we can be that village and give each other permission to grieve. Look, before we close out, I wanted to say a prayer for those watching who might be experiencing this right now. So let's pray. Father, we come to you right now thanking you so much for this candid conversation on pregnancy and infant loss in the Black community. God, we pray for that person experiencing this right now, God. We pray that through this conversation tonight, you met them right at that point of loneliness, right at that point of anger, right at that point of fear and grief. Father, I ask even now that you would just transform their heart, God. Touch their heart, remind them that they're not alone. Wrap your loving arms around them. Send that presence in whatever way it may come. Uh, Father, we just pray right now on that sister experiencing infertility, God, asking that you would wrap your arms right around her, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ladies, again, thank you so, so much for joining me on tonight. Um, And again, Visit www.kayawardshares.com if you want to check out this video again or for more resources and information on grief and loss as a whole. Love you guys. See you later. Thank you, ladies.